On today's lecture, we're going to be talking about grading. Grading is a very important part of teaching reading. If I don't grade my students, I am not going to remember the progress as I should. The students aren't going to be able to see their progress, and the parents also won't be able to see the progress the children are making. Or can I say the lack of progress that the students should be making? All right, so our grading is very, very important. It's the eyes for the different people to see what's happening. All right, so you need to take your grading seriously. And the, the hard thing about grading reading is that it's not cut and dry. Grading is very opinionated, okay? In my opinion, you did this. You are reading like this. It's not two plus two equals three. Oh, that's wrong. Mark it wrong, all right? So there's some very important things we have to keep in mind while we are grading. There's lots of different ways we can grade, but you have to have that basic groundwork of what am I looking for in my students' reading? What, what do I want them to be working on, okay? So we have six things that we are going to be talking about in grading. So let's first of all talk about oral reading, okay? Oral reading is the perfect place for young, young students to practice and to respond and to show the teacher how well they're doing, okay? So we have to grade that oral reading. Now, we're going to be looking at six things when we grade our reading, but every day, you don't have to concentrate on every single one of those. Sometimes for um, a motivation, I would have a special motivational hat or I said, today we're gonna have the king or the queen reader of the day and I'd have a crown up there. And they're all looking at that crown like, wow, I would love to walk down the hall wearing that crown in front of everybody. And so when I do a motivation with reading, I will usually pick one of these six areas and say today, I'm going to pick a king and a, king, a queen reader, and I am looking today for punctuation. I'm going to listen carefully, and if you stop at your punctuation, just like we learned it, if you read your exclamation sentences excitedly, if you pause at your comma, okay, you've taught them all the rules, they're practicing it, you can key in on one or two areas and use that, or you can grade all of them. I grade all of them, but sometimes I take special, um, a special look at certain areas because I want them to improve. Now, um, there will be extras of these. Will you pass those out? You, that way you got your own. This is a teacher oral reading evaluation sheet that we have, and you know, I don't, I don't grade every day. All right, um, the students don't know when I'm grading them. Can anyone tell me why that's really important? Tamar? So they would be kind of natural if they won't. They would be natural, that is a very good, yes. Um, it's kind of like me getting videoed. I am not natural when I'm being videoed. It puts a pressure on you to do things a certain way. What else am I? Can they get a habit to read correctly instead of just doing it when they know you're grading? Ha, ba, ba, ba. Oh, Mrs. Brader's grading today. Ha, da, 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 da. Okay, what biblical concept am I trying to teach that is going the opposite if I say, okay, today I'm grading, so do your best? To do your best at all times. Whatsoever thy hand findeth to do, do with thy might. Do with all thy might. And every time you read for me, you should be doing it to the best of your ability. And if I say, all right, boys and girls, let's read really well today because I'm grading you, that's not teaching them to do right every time. Okay? So I would not let them know when you're grading. I just have those grading papers on your desk. They're in their little reading circle. They're, grading, they're reading for you, and you're just making comments right there on that sheet. You can add up the grade later. You've got your comments. You've got your point systems down, okay? So let's talk about these six areas, though, just so that you'll have a little bit of um, 
knowledge on what exactly they are, because sometimes it could be a little confusing. So number one is smoothness. That is not difficult to understand. Smoothness is, I guess, the easiest way I teach my children, my students, to be smooth when they're reading is I tell them, read like you talk. And of course, I always give them examples because some children are so intent on each word to get that each word properly spoken that they're very choppy. And so I have to stop them and I say, are you reading like you're talking to me? Ma'am, no. Listen to this. Do you talk like this? Ma'am, no. They can hear that but they just read me a sentence doing it that way. So I have to say, then read like you talk to me. Put those words together, all right? So being a smooth reader is reading like you talk, okay? Something else that I help them with their smoothness is I tell them if you read all the way to the punctuation, then take a breath, then stop. Read all the way to your punctuation and then do what your punctuation says. So sometimes I have to take those students and I take one sentence and I know they're going to memorize that sentence, but if I can key in on it and help them to understand smooth reading in just learning that one sentence, it's well worth it. So I take one sentence and I have them read it over and over and over again until they read it very smoothly. And by the time they're, they're getting it smooth for me, they're, they're looking at me and saying the sentence. They're not reading anymore, but they're getting the idea of smoothness, okay? Sometimes I have to break that sentence down all the way into two word phrases and say, stop. The first two words of the sentence is the pig, okay? That's the first two words. And I'll say, read those two words for me. Ma'am, the pig, ooh, no, let's Put those two words together. Make it sound like one word. Ma'am, the pig. No, no, we need to read it faster. Ma'am, the pig. Oh, no, well, put them together. Make it sound like one word. Ma'am, I said, listen, I'll help you. The pig. Ooh, now you try it. Ma'am, the pig. Yes. Now let's add one more word to that. Ma'am, the pig sat. Ooh. Let's put that next word onto it too. I have to teach them what I mean by reading smoothly. They don't understand. So sometimes I have to just pick a sentence and we need to just tear that sentence apart until they understand what I mean by reading smoothly. But if you will take the time to do that, you're going to go so much farther with them, okay? So the first thing is smoothness. You want them to have good phrasing. And I do that by tell them to, telling them to read all the way to the punctuation and then, okay, we know that a comma means just stop and pause and take a breath and go on. All right? They know that. They know that a punctuation, the, the period says stop. Now go on. Same with the exclamation and the question mark. They know those already, so you can work on that. And I already said read like you're talking. Okay? So teaching them to read smoothly. I have to take the time. Um, so many times I think the teachers fall into the trap of, I don't have time to dig into that. Well, you may not have time right now, but if you take that time right now, then later on, you're gonna have all the time in the world because later on when the stories get bigger and the words get harder, they're gonna already be reading smoothly and you won't have to take that time later on, okay? So take care of the things as they come up. It's kind of like take care of the little problems before they become big problems. Right now at the beginning of the year, if I'm working on smoothness, that's I'm working on one thing. But pretty soon, I'm gonna be working on all six of those things all together and as they get older, there's no, okay, today we're working on this. It's you read nicely. You overall readers, okay? So take care of the little things, and then as you're adding on, it'll be much easier. So smoothness. The second thing I want to look at is punctuation. 
We all know what punctuation is, but do our students know? Not usually, especially if they're K4, K5, even some of the first graders that I'm working with, <clears throat> um, helping them along and I'll say, what is this? And I come up with some really wild explanations of what those exclamation point and question mark. They don't know them. They've forgotten. The, the last teacher hit it and they learned it then, but they've been out of school and they've got other things on their mind. We have to remind them. And you have to consistently review, review, review the things that you've learned so it stays fresh. Because if you review, 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 and those things are staying fresh, you add one more thing new onto it, it they just flow. But if you don't review it, it's going to be like they're learning three and four and five things new over again. You don't want that. All right, so punctuation. Let's look at the four kinds. And this is how, what I teach them. I teach them that a period means to stop. So we were in the reading circles a couple days ago, and I said, does your mom and dad drive a car? Yes, they do. They have some rules that they need to follow on the road, don't they? What kind of rules do you think? Immediately, ma'am, there's a stop sign. What does that mean? They have to stop and look both ways before they go on. They know, okay? And I said, did you know that reading has rules too? We have a stop sign in our reading books too. Anybody think you can find a stop sign on the page? Point to a stop sign. And that by then they all know what I'm talking about, so they're pointing to the period. And I'll say, what's the reading stop sign? Ma'am, a period. Yeah. Okay, children are smart and they can connect things. You give them something to connect to, they're gonna understand, all right? So then we talk about a comma. When I talk about a comma, I say you pause and take a short breath and go on. So it's not like a period where we're stopping and go on. It's just a go on, just a short breath and go on. And if I can teach them that before they've seen it in their books, then that first comma comes up and I say, oh, a comma, what's that mean? S take a short breath and go on. Let's try it. And usually the first comma they see, I'm going to say, everyone point to the comma, I'm going to read this sentence for you so you can understand what I mean. It's very important to understand that three, four, five, six, seven-year-olds you can say something, but unless you help them to understand what you're saying, it's going to go whoosh, right over their heads. In college classes, have you ever had a teacher say something and you had no clue what they were talking about? You didn't even know if they were talking about an object or a person or a, a form of matter. You, it was, you, you were out of your realm. A comma is out of their realm if they've never heard it before. So I say, let's find the comma. We find the comma, point to it. Now listen to this sentence. And when you get to that comma, you're going to hear me pause and go on. Okay, so as the teacher, you're showing them, you're connecting it to something, and they say, oh, I understand what she means. Now you try it, okay? So a question mark. When I get to the question mark, all I have to do is say, do you ever ask your mommy for something? Yes. Well, our questions, when they're written, they have a special sign at the end of our sentences and they look like this. And I teach them the question mark. This is called a question mark. When you ask something, it's a question mark. Now, then I teach them, usually when you ask a question, your voice goes up at the end. Okay, mom, can I have a drink? Let's try a question. Let's say, how are you today? And so they'll go, how are you today? And they raise their voice and say, oh, that's good. You're getting the idea. Well, they ask questions all the time. But for me to say, raise your voice at the end. Sometimes we raise our voice at certain words, not just at the end. But if I can teach them the concept of raising your voice at the end, they will get question mark. And so then a lot of times, well, let's go to the next one, the exclamation point. Very easy to teach them exclamation point, but the hard thing is to get them to say it if they're five-year-olds and it's really cute to listen to them try to say it. What is this? Uh, I don't, I'm not even going to say it. 
but it's cute. But you teach them what an exclamation point means, it means you get excited. And that day that I'm teaching exclamation points, we read sentences on the board, and I have the students read them, and I read them, and I have one student read them, and I say, okay, I have something here, I have some stickers here, and today I'm going to give stickers to excited readers because I'm teaching them the exclamation point. And I can take, I can take and make a little exclamation point to put at the end of the sentence, and I can have those sentences be just regular periods, and I can say, I want to make this an exclamation sentence. And if you read it excitedly, I'll let you put the exclamation point on the sentence. They love it. Students are hands-on. You know, when I was teaching them the letters, when I, when I was teaching kindergarten, I teach them the letters, and um, I says I as an ice cream, okay? So when we teach the long I sounds, I would have ice cream cones up on the board, and I would make sure I had strawberry and chocolate and a vanilla, and I even had green mint, and different kinds, all different kinds. And if they could just tell me I says I as an ice cream, I would let them come up to the board they could pull an ice cream cone off and pretend to lick it. And I had every single student's attention to pretend to lick an ice cream cone. Because they'd come up and I'd say, oh, what flavor are they going to pick? And they'd pick one, i said, what flavor did you pick? Ma'am, it's chocolate, ooh, let me see, do you like it? Mmm, <laughs> you know, ooh, yummy. And they, they would go berserk just to get up and pretend to lick an ice cream cone and tell me what their favorite color is. Okay, so make your exclamation points, make your little dot three periods, make your question marks, have your sentences on the board and let them practice. I'm going to say a sentence and you have to tell me if it's a question, if it's an exclamation point, or if it's just a regular one for a period. And you can put the exclamation, okay, hands on. Get them working with it and understanding it, but you work very well with this right at the beginning. Because if you can conquer the different ways the sentences read, you're going to have nice readers. If you let them read exclamation sentence, exclamatory sentences and questions just like this, you're going to be fighting the whole year trying to have expressive readers, readers okay? So watch the punctuations, even have some commas in there so that they can practice stopping, taking, taking a break. But the, that punctuation, if you work on that, did you see I said they're going to be expressive readers later on? That's something else we're working at later. It all goes together. So you can't say, well, I'm just going to work on expression and the punctuation will come. No, work on every single thing. And it, that's why I said it's really good sometimes to just say in your own mind, today I'm working on punctuation, or today I'm just working on smoothness, or today I'm working on, because that way you're making sure they're getting every aspect of their reading, every little aspect they're, they're accomplishing what you want. The third thing is enunciation. Oh, I have it out of... I have it out of order. Well, you can just pick which one's there. But I have in my notes enunciation. It's up there. I think I should change this to match the oral reading evaluation sheets. Enunciation, and this is very important. Are you ready to write this down? Enunciation is speaking clearly in saying the word. My mother always used to tell me, stop mumbling. What do you want? Stop mumbling. Speak clearly, okay? Speaking clearly. Clearly, correctly, and not mumbling. Just put that in parenthesis behind it, okay? Enunciation is speaking clearly. Very, very important. Um, I really have been trying all these years. I t have taught for almost 30 years now, and I really have been trying to do that for my kids all these years, so I do speak slower, I try to speak more clearly, and I knew that I had gone overboard when um, I went through the lunch line a few years ago, and they asked me if I wanted what they were serving, I'd say, yes, thank you. 
And they looked at me and said, I can tell you're a kindergarten teacher. I went, oh, oh no, <laughs> overboard. <laughs> but I do, I've just done it for so long, trying to be the example for the kids that I think I do a very good job of speaking clearly, correctly. I slow down, I don't speak too fast. Okay, sometimes I think I speak too slowly. Enunciation, make sure you don't let them fall through on this one. And you know what, normal speaking, they're not going to speak all the time like they're reading, okay? There's gonna be times they're getting excited and they speed up and, oh ma'am, you're never gonna guess what I did. You don't have to say, stop. You can tell me that story if you enunciate, <laughs> okay? Don't go overboard with it. But it's something that you want to work on because the reading, oh, there's nothing worse than listening to a child read when they're mumbling and you can't understand what they're saying and it's boring, okay? Underneath this, put a little star and I want to give you a definition of another word that's very close to enunciation, but it's not the same. Some people mix this up and the word is called pronunciation. Many people mix up enunciation and pronunciation. Enunciation is how you're speaking. Speak clearly, correctly. Pronunciation is being able to say what is there. Can you pronounce this word? If the word is horse and they say donkey, they did not pronounce the word correctly. If the word is owl and they say owl, they did not pronounce the word correctly, okay? So pronunciation is not one of our six, but I am watching for that, and that kind of comes along in the accuracy, if they can pronounce that word. But I put it there just so that you could see the difference between it. Enunciation is speaking that word clearly and correctly. Pronunciation is if they can say that word correctly, okay? All right, so then the fourth thing, it's up there, speed, speed. Behind that, I want you to put speed enables the reader to read at a nice, even pace. That's my clue words there, a nice, even pace. Okay, so many times you're saying to your students, let's try to read that faster. Read like you talk. You do not talk like this, okay? So speed, a nice, even pace, okay? Number five, accuracy. Accuracy. There's two things underneath accuracy I wanna to try to get across. Accuracy, accuracy is reading the words in the sentence correctly pronouncing them right. Okay, that's part of accuracy. The second part of accuracy is making, you, making sure you say exactly what that sentence is. Many students will add words to the sentences they're reading, or many students will leave words out. They skip words sometimes. That's not being accurate, and I have to watch for that. Sometimes, um, Sometimes the word will be sin and they'll say sit, but they're reading at a good pace and they just go right on. They haven't even noticed that they said the wrong word. My job is to stop and say, look at that word, reread that word. And they'll read it correctly and I'll say, is that what you read the first time? No, read that sentence over again and read it correctly. I don't want to say, oh, they missed three words in that sentence, but it's okay. No, it's not okay. I don't ever want my students to think it's okay just to picture read or just skip over words. I want accurate readers. You know, many people say to me as the students that I've taught get up into the second, first, second, third, fourth grade, wow, these, these kids really write neatly when they want to. Anybody can write neatly when they want to and they can be sloppy, but you know why? I always say, oh, it's because I am a stickler with the way they write. They have to write neat in writing, but I don't accept sloppy work in spelling. I don't, expect, I don't accept it 
in math, they have to be neat. I make sure that they're neat in everything that they turn into me. If I know that, now I am not an ogre, if I have an average writer and I see their writing average in, in every area, okay, we're working on it. But if I have a very neat writer and they turn in spelling words that are sloppy, they redo them. I'm not going to have them picking and choosing when they want to do right because God says, do right all the time. So here we are, back to building a well-rounded student. In whatever I'm doing, it has to be everything. You can't just say, oh, well, you know, I'm working on um, standing right in line today, so if they talk, well, I'm, I'm going to let that go. Mm. You can't let things go. So as you're building good readers, if they miss words or they say the wrong words, you can't let it go. How can they fix what they're doing if you don't show them where they're wrong? So really be very firm with this accuracy. Don't fall into the trap. The, the, there are some reading experts that say, oh, just let them explore on their own and let them just read. If they feel like they're reading, then that's good. No, no. There's a difference between reading and guessing. I don't want guessers. All right, and then the last thing is expression. Expression. And all I have behind that is, did you make it interesting and exciting? Did you make it interesting and exciting? It, there is nothing more enjoyable than to have a student stand up and read for you and you just, it's great. It's fun listening to them. Um, I, have, I have a couple of kids right now that if I could, I would just have them read Forget everybody else because they are sharp, they have personality, they have expression. And then you have the new students that are just struggling to read those words. But you know what? My goal is to get every student to be an expressive reader, to be a good reader. Okay, so I have to work on all six of these areas. And expression is really fun to work on with the kids. You say, well, Mrs. Brader, it may be fun, but some of them are just quiet and, and it's hard to bring them out. It is, and that's what's so fun, because you have a child that's, that's always like this, and all of a sudden in reading class, you put up a motivation for them, and they decide, I think I could try this one time just for that motivation, and they come out of their shell, and then what Bible principle do I think of? A word fitly spoken in due season, how good it is. That child makes that effort to try to do it like you're asking them. I praise them and I give them a motivation and they think, oh, I can do this. And my teacher's proud of me. I think I'll do it again. We're helping them to grow. We're helping them to learn and to grow, okay? So there's just a couple things though we need to talk about, all right? Um, I remember one time, well, many times it's happened, but I have five children. They've come through, they're in high school, college, and out, okay? So I would bring, they, they would bring their papers home. I would always take every paper out of that DNF folder. Even if there were no DNFs, they sent all the papers home for me to see. So I'd take them out and I'd say, oh, you got a 96 on this. Let's see what you did wrong. Oh, well, that was a silly error, wasn't it? Do you think you could have caught that error? Yes. How do we catch our errors? Check my work. Okay. I'd go through everything. And one day, I pulled out a reading evaluation form, and they got a B on reading. And that's okay. I had average readers, some of my kids, but this happened to be one of my good readers. And I thought, oh, that's weird. And so I looked, I said, oh, a B, okay. We can do a little better, can't we? Let's look and see what we can work on. And smoothness, enunciation, punctuation, points taken off. And the comments at the bottom of the sheet said, you did a great job today. I'm sorry, but I don't think a B is, you did a great job today. Do you understand where I'm going with as a mom? How can I help my child improve if their grade and their comments don't match. So as you're grading, all right, 
as I grade, some of my students will be doing things, they'll, they'll read a wrong word. Can you hand that to me more? They'll read a wrong word. At the bottom of our sheets, there's comments. There's a place for comments. So many times, they're re they read a wrong word, and I'll say, oh, look at that word, try that again. And while they're doing it, I'm writing down what they said, and then in parenthesis, what the word should have been. Because later on, when I have time, I'm going to fill in these comments. And trust your instincts when you put their grade here on this side while they were reading. If you said, oh, they, they didn't do that well on accuracy, so I'm going to downgrade them on accuracy, trust your instincts later on when you go back and you say, I downgraded them on accuracy. Look at the comments, the little things that you put, and then write on there for the parents what you think they need to work on. So I guess, make sure you write this down, what I want to say about grading sheets, make sure that your comments match the grade you give them. Okay? That's really important. You are the extension of the parent and you are their eyes. So parents who are really involved in their students' lives are trying to help them to do better. And when they get home with their papers, they're trying to help them and they can't if you have not done your job. So make sure that your comments match the grade. Here's another thing that it's a very easy thing to fall into the trap of. You have to be careful that you don't give them an A in reading because oh, they tried so hard today. I have kids that can't read two vowel words yet in my first grade class because they're brand new and they've never had it. And the other day I had one of them almost get it right the first time. I had to work them through it. Does that mean I gave them an A because they finally got it? No. Now, that's where the comments come in. You give them the grade they deserve, okay? But then in your comments in the bottom, you say, I was so proud of so-and-so today. He tried so hard. He's getting better. Keep working with him. It's, it's helping. Comments are, you know, on the progress reports, we send progress reports home every three weeks. And the progress report, some of them have it at the top, and then there's about this much space to write comments. But then a lot of them have the grades on the front, and then you flip it over on the back as your teacher, you write comments. I never, ever just would write one comment or two comments. I have a problem with writing too much. And now that I'm working with two or three different teachers, I have to be careful that I make my comments on the, on the progress reports. I, I give them room to talk too, okay? But the parents look forward to those comments so that they can help work with their kids, all right? So, yes, I'm glad they tried hard, but trying hard does not deserve an A. You can put on there, their grade is a C sometimes barely a C because average is C. But in parenthesis or at the bottom on the comments, they get an A for effort. And, and let the parents know that because the parents are struggling with their kids trying to help them and then all of a sudden they say, oh, an A for effort. That means you tried really hard today. I am proud of you, okay? So make sure that you give them the grade they deserve but then you cover everything in your comments, okay? And then one more thing about grading. Now remember, the teaching reading goes all the way up through sixth grade. There's lots of different kinds of reading. We're gonna talk about them, but you have to use good judgment. If, mm, let's say there's, there's a, um, a timed reading, and let's say that you gave them two minutes to do that timed reading and then one minute to answer questions. And you get that done and you grade it and over half of the class fails, maybe even more. As a teacher, you're looking at those grades and you say, well, I guess they're just not in the mood to do this today. I guess they deserve that grade. Are you sure? Are you sure? Use good judgment. 
If the majority of the class is struggling with something, what does that tell you? You might have taught it, but did they really understand what you were teaching? Might be a concept that they just went right over their head. Don't just keep going if there's a problem. Use good judgment. Sometimes you're going to have to stop and say, whoa, the class did not get that, so I'm going to hit that first thing tomorrow, and we're going to make sure they understand that. And sometimes you have to take a quiz or something that they've just all bombed. And sometimes you say, well, I'm not giving these grades. I'm going to reteach it, redo it, and then I'll do the other grades. Okay? So don't just keep going and say, well, I taught it. They didn't get it. That's their own fault. That's not a teacher's heart. Use good judgment. Know when you have to go over the material again. Okay? So that's grading oral reading. There's a lot involved in that, isn't there? But it's fun, and it's fun to see the children improve. Let's talk about grading silent reading now, though. How do I grade silent reading? The silent reading is when they're not saying anything out loud. I need to grade that, okay? So let's talk about it. There's two things that I am going to grade on when they're silent reading. I'm going to grade on comprehension, and I'm going to grade on their speed, okay? And I do that by having um, stories that are called speed and comprehension or give timed readings. And that's where I either have a book or I give them a one-page story and I say, okay, you have this much time to read this story and answer questions. Or you have this much time to read the story, then we turn it over, you have a minute to answer these questions. I remember when I was growing up, I had a reader I went to the last two years of my schooling. I went to a Christian school. It was an ACE school. And they had stories in a round thing. And it would just take the rate of my reading. And so it, on the inside, would give me one line at a time that I had to read at a certain rate. And it was fun and easy as long as it was slow enough. But when they started turning up that rate and I had to force myself to read faster, that was awful. But I needed it. And our kids need that too. We don't want slow readers. The faster they read, the better they'll understand. Remember that? So we want to push them to get faster and faster. And our silent reading does that. All right? So we're um, grading them on comprehension. Behind that, put this. We're going to see if they understand what they're reading. And we do that by testing them. We ask them questions. So we're seeing if they understand what they're reading by asking them questions. And then we're also testing them on speed by I'm, I'm testing them on the amount of material they can cover in a certain time. I'm, really what I'm doing is I'm pushing them out of their comfort zone. I'm making them read faster than they are comfortable with, but it's good for them. So if I'm going to have speed and comprehension quizzes where they're going to have to read and then they're going to have to answer questions, you as a teacher are going to have to think ahead, how do I want to do that? And I learned the hard way, the first thing, get yourself a timer. It can be your phone that you can set for two minutes that will go off, or it can be a kitchen timer, okay, those obnoxious ones that go, okay. You want to have a timer, and let me tell you why. If you get a timer and that obnoxious timer goes off, is there any question in your mind whether a child knows whether to stop or not? No. But there have been times that I've been at home reading a book that's a really good book. And when I read a really good book, I get into that book and I zone everything else out. And one day I was reading, I was sitting in my rocking chair reading, my kids were at the kitchen table doing their homework and I was enjoying myself and all of a sudden I have one of my children in front of me going, Mom! I'm like, what? Mom, I've been standing in front of you calling your name. I was so keyed into my book that I had zoned everything else. Now. You set a timer 
And a child, don't you think that could happen to a child too? They're so concentrating on what they're doing that they might miss you saying, time's up, put your, put your pencil down. I've had it happen. So I, as a teacher, need to plan and prepare the best way I can help my students because I definitely don't want to accuse them of cheating. But there are some students you say, all right, time's up, put your pencil down, and then they're going, right? Oh, I, I'm just going to circle these last five answers that I didn't get done. No, well, that's cheating. But if you say time's up and a student didn't hear you and they're, on, and they're going on, you can't say you're cheating. Do you understand where I'm going with that? You get a timer that's loud and obnoxious and not one child can say, ma'am, I didn't hear the timer. It'll break through to them. Okay, so plan ahead. How do I want to do these timed readings and the quizzes so that I can make sure that I, I'm giving them a fair shake? So get yourself a timer and then you teach them exactly how you want them to do it. So the first timed reading we have, you're going to say, all right, boys and girls, when I say get ready for a, a speed reader, all right, then they, need, they know they need to get out their book, they know they need to get out a pen, okay? And they know to have that sitting down, you instruct them, all right, here's what we're gonna do. I'm gonna set a timer. You're going to read and answer the questions and you have three minutes to do that in. When you're done, put your pencil down and go over your answers. Check your work. When the timer goes off, put your pencil down and turn your paper over. If you do it the same way every day, there's no question what they're supposed to do. So if a child knows you've done it the same way since the beginning of the school year, and now two months later, you say the timer goes off, and you see him with his paper up and his pencil in his hand, if there's no question that he knows he's being bad. Okay, so you're, you're cutting out any chances of cheating and lying because you set up a certain way to do it and there's no questions. All right, so when we grade our silent reading, we are grading on the comprehension and the speed. We're forcing them to get faster as they read. Okay, so that is grading very quickly. Uh, right here, it's just a small little section here. Let's talk about, then, how to teach a child to hold their book. There's lots of different ways to hold a book, but when you're dealing with little kids, I've found there's a certain way to have them stand and sit and hold their books that will just cut out any possible problems. All right, so at the beginning of the year, we teach the children how to hold their books. Now, in my class, they know that let's say they're standing to read for me. They know that they need to stand up straight and tall with their feet together. So that's the first thing you wanna put. Stand up straight and tall with your feet together. Then you wanna tell them to hold their book with one hand on each side of the book. <clears throat> now there's a couple reasons for that. Many times I find myself um, reading with them and just because I'm doing other things too I find myself holding my book in one hand and writing but that's not being a very good example to them because then I look out and I see them following my example so I have to be very careful when I'm standing up in front of them and they're reading for me I try to hold my book exactly like I want them to hold it one hand on each side of the book and it's near the bottom now let's think very quickly with me teaching them to hold their book, is it absolutely necessary for a child to hold their book like this in order to read? No. They can lay the book on the desk and still learn to read. They can hold it with one hand and still learn to read. But I, as a teacher, am thinking ahead, and if I have them holding their book with two hands, what are their hands doing? They're busy. If their hands are not busy, on their book holding it, their hands are gonna be busy playing or doing something else, okay? Not always playing. If they're holding a book with one hand, a lot of my slower students are pointing across the page with their words, with their fingers to their words. And remember what I said? You don't wanna let them use their fingers because it slows them down. 
They cannot use their finger as a guide if you're having them hold their book a certain way. Um, the other day, I had to really go over this again for a couple of new students that I had. They were sitting at their desks reading, and we'll talk about that. But one of the kids was holding the book, and I've done this before where it just, I don't know, I'm not thinking right, I guess, but I take my fingers and I fan the pages sometimes. And he was doing that while we were in reading class. I was like, okay, let's talk about our books again, boys and girls. Think about it, let's hold our books right. Even if we're sitting down, we're gonna hold our books right, okay? So, you're gonna need to know how to hold a book. When you're standing, make sure your students stand straight and tall. They hold one hand on each side of the book. And an important thing about this, I have two minutes left. The important thing about this is that they hold their book at a bent elbows length. They should have, have their book almost like an L. Their arm should be an L. They bend their elbows straight out. So really their book should be about at their tummy. Okay? It should be there. Do you, do you know why? Because some students have the bad habit and it's not always because their eyes are bad, it's bad habit. They have their book up here. Number one, they're hurting their eyes. Number two, I can't hear them. It's going to sound mumbled. Make sure they're holding their book properly. Just bend their elbows straight out, and that's a perfect distance from the book to the eyes. Okay? And I have them do that. Do you know why I know it's a bad habit? Think about it. <clears throat> Little kids at home, mom says, go read. So they go get a book. Some of them run to the couch and sit on the couch and read. That's okay but some of them lay on the floor. What happens when they're laying on the floor? They lay down, they put their elbows on the floor, and their book is right here, right? And that means that they're hurting their eyes. They're forming bad habits, and you have to, in reading circle, get those bad habits out. You get the bad habits out by teaching them how to hold the book. When they're sitting down, it's kind of the same idea. They need to sit up straight and tall, okay? They need to hold their books, one hand on either side, but they tip the book back, not lay it flat, they tip the book back so that the bottom of the book is resting on the desk. And it's angled back a little bit. So make sure you know for the test how to hold a book, standing and sitting, okay? The one thing that I want to say before we quit today is while they're holding that book, while they're doing reading circles for you, it's your job as a teacher to watch for eyesight problems. And it's very easy, very easy to deal with it. You just go to the parents and say, have you ever had their eyes checked? I notice they're struggling seeing what I write on the board. I notice when they read their their, their book for me, they keep putting it real close to their face, and that could be a bad habit, but I'm afraid I see too many things that might mean that they're having eye problems, okay? So one of my children, as a parent, Mom of the Year Award, fourth grade, I had somebody walk up to me one day and say, have you ever watched your child read when they're just at home reading? They make the weirdest faces. I went, you know, I just noticed that the other day, and I said, stop looking stupid. <laughs> That's all I did, and I went on. Two days later, somebody else said to me, have you ever watched your child when they're reading? They do some really weird things, and I thought, okay, too many people are seeing this. I better get him into the eye doctor. Fourth grade, never been to the eye doctor, okay? He gets in the chair. The eye doctor says, Okay, Stephen, I want you to read that letter on the back. I'm sitting here. Stephen's looking. He says, ha, 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 there's no letter there. And I went, stop it. Read that letter right now. And he starts crying. He goes, there's nothing there, Mom. I don't see anything. Oh, man, did I feel awful. He had never complained to me. He had never said my eyes hurt. He never complained to the teacher. And yet there had been little signs here and there, and I missed them. There are going to be little signs in your classroom here and there. If you see a child keep doing this, talk to the parents and say, I think it might be a bad habit, but please would you help me and have them hold their book right at home because I'm afraid it's going to cause problems. Please get them in and have them checked. Okay?